This is The Critical Thinker, Episode 8. Hi everyone, welcome to the show. I'm Kevin, your host, and this is The Critical Thinker, the podcast dedicated to helping you master the art and science of reasoning well. So last episode, I introduced what I consider to be the five essential components of critical thinking, five areas of knowledge or skill development or attitude that you need to cultivate in order to be a truly effective critical thinker. At the top of this list was logic, and I want to talk a bit more about logic on this episode. But before we get to that, I'd like to make two quick announcements. In episode six of the podcast, the mailbag episode, I introduced the concept of a fallacy and gave a few examples, one of which was the fallacy of equivocation. This fallacy involves using the same term with more than one meaning in an argument, where the logic only works if you use the same meaning consistently throughout the argument. Now, if you watch the video version of the podcast, you notice that on on the last slide, I presented an argument about abortion. It was real short. It went like this. Premise one, abortion involves the intentional killing of an innocent human being. Premise two, the intentional killing of an innocent human being is murder. Therefore, abortion is murder. And what I did was I challenged my YouTube viewers to look at this argument and think about whether or not it commits the fallacy of equivocation. When I did that podcast, I didn't have a separate video podcast on iTunes, so I assumed that only my YouTube viewers would see that last slide. But at any rate, I got a few email requests for my analysis of that argument. So what I wanted to say is that If you're interested, you can find that analysis on the blog on the homepage of criticalthinkingtutorials.com, where the title of the post is Equivocation and the Status of the Human Fetus. Okay, the second announcement is just to reiterate the point that there are two versions of this podcast available on iTunes. There's an audio-only version for folks who like listening to podcasts in the car or at the gym or walking the dog, and there's a video version, which is just the audio version with some slides added. You can subscribe to one or the other or both, and you can find both if you just type the critical thinker in the iTunes search bar. The logos are identical, but the video version has the word video in brackets after the title, and the audio version doesn't. Okay, moving on to our main topic, we're here to talk about logic. What about logic? Well, my main goal today is to help you better understand what's important about logic from a critical thinking standpoint. Logic is a science. It's a technical discipline that you can study for its own sake. But most of what logicians study is, frankly, irrelevant for critical thinking purposes. And today, I want to help you figure out what's important about logic, what parts are important to learn, and what parts you can safely leave to the specialists. Let me start by describing the sort of thing you'll be taught in an introductory course in formal or symbolic logic. These are normally taught by faculty and philosophy departments, And at most universities, a student majoring in philosophy has to take a course like this. And in most master's and PhD programs, students have to pass an exam on formal logic to get their degree. But you'll also find courses like these taught in computer science departments, and sometimes in linguistics departments if there's an emphasis in the program on formal linguistics. And in most mathematics departments, there's at least one course in mathematical logic or foundations of mathematics that covers more intermediate and advanced topics. So what are you taught in these classes? Well, in your first class, you'll be told that logic is the discipline that studies principles of correct reasoning, rules for determining what follows from what. More specifically, logic is concerned with providing symbolic models of correct reasoning. What makes this kind of analysis possible is that reasoning is something that we do in language and through language. In language, we can distinguish between syntax and semantics. Syntax is about the rules and relationships that underwrite the grammar of a language how the symbols of a language combine to make meaningful, grammatically well-formed statements. Semantics is about how those symbols acquire meaning in the first place, and how the meanings of statements relate to the meanings of the component parts of a statement, the basic symbolic vocabulary. So in language, we can distinguish the form of a linguistic assertion from the content of that assertion. This form-content distinction is essential because logical inference is about form, it's not about content. And one of the first things you do in a logic class is learn to rewrite statements and arguments in symbolic form so that you can then evaluate the reasoning on a purely formal level. How you do this depends on the kind of arguments you want to study. What you learn in a first logic course is that there's more than one system of logic. There are multiple systems, and each of these systems captures different aspects of the structure of natural language and argumentation in natural language. 
For example, you learn that the first formal system of logic was developed by Aristotle, and it's known as categorical logic, or the logic of Aristotelian syllogisms. Categorical statements are statements of the form all A or B, some A or B, no A or B, all A are not B, and so on. The A's and the B's refer to categories of things. So when I say all whales are mammals, this statement expresses a relationship between the category of things that are whales and the category of things that are mammals. Namely, it asserts that the category of mammals contains, as a subset, the category of whales. You'll then be taught a set of techniques for diagramming and evaluating arguments that use premises like these. Usually a modification of the Venn diagram method to model the relationships between categories. And you can then see at a glance whether a categorical argument uses a valid or an invalid logical form. Now an important limitation of Aristotle's system is that it doesn't really deal with compound statements like I'll have the chicken salad or the lasagna for lunch. Or, if Jack finishes his homework, then he can go to the movies. Here we have statements that are made up of two smaller component statements, and the truth or falsity of the whole compound statement depends on the truth or falsity of the component statements that make it up. Now it was the Stoic philosophers in the 3rd century BC who first worked out a system for reasoning with compound statements like this. This was the start of what we now call propositional logic, or sentential logic. And it's called this because the smallest unit of logical analysis is the whole statement, and we use letters to symbolize whole statements. So the statement, Jack finishes his homework, can be symbolized with, say, the letter H. And Jack can go to the movies could be symbolized with letter M. And we could represent the conditional claim as if H, then M. In propositional logic, or sentential logic, we have a set of rules for evaluating what are called truth functional arguments. Arguments where the inferences turn on the truth functional structure of the premises. Now I know that sounds very abstract, but the ideas are simple enough. They're what lie behind simple arguments like this. Either the brother is the murderer, or the girlfriend is the murderer. But the girlfriend was out of the country at the time the crime was committed. So it follows that the brother must be the murderer. This argument has a simple form, either A or B. Not B, therefore A which is a valid argument form in propositional logic. It's the basic argument form used in any kind of detective or forensic or diagnostic work where we use evidence to eliminate alternative possibilities. Now the next thing you learn in a symbolic logic course is what's called predicate logic. Predicate logic is related to categorical logic in that it, it too tries to unpack and symbolize the internal structure of propositions. In this case, the relationship between subject terms and predicate terms. So in predicate logic, you might represent a claim like all whales are mammals as for all x, if x is a whale, then x is a mammal. And you'd use letters to symbolize the predicate expressions, x is a whale and x is a mammal. Then you'll learn a bunch of proof techniques for demonstrating whether arguments symbolized in this way are valid or invalid. And that about wraps up most first courses in symbolic logic. You've learned three logical systems, Aristotelian categorical logic, modern propositional logic, and modern predicate logic. And you've learned how to symbolize fragments of natural language in each of these formal languages, rewrite arguments in symbolic form, and then evaluate the logical validity of these arguments using a variety of formal techniques. And you'll also be told that this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are many different formal systems in logic that are used to analyze different fragments of natural language. For example, we often talk about certain statements being necessarily true or possibly true. And the logic that governs inferences that deal with these concepts is called modal logic. And we can go on and on. There are temporal logics, relevance logics, deontic logics, and so on. These are the sorts of systems that professional logicians study. Now, here's the question that you and I care about. It's not hard to see how the study of formal languages and logical systems might be of intrinsic philosophical interest. And it's not hard to see how it might be of practical interest to people working in computer science or artificial intelligence or formal linguistics or the foundations of mathematics. But what does any of this have to do with critical thinking? 